to my dungeon. Welcome to Cauldron Script. I'm your host, Master Cauldron. If you're new to the show, I use my 24 years of BDSM experience and 20 years working in the psychology field to dispel myths, get rid of stereotypes, and answer your questions about BDSM. You can call in at 865-268-4005 to leave your questions or visit the crypt at cauldronscrypt.com. On this episode of The Crypt, we're returning to DomCon LA 2019 for a conversation with the founder of the international Mr. and Miss Olympus Leather Contest, Dave Rhodes. In this conversation, we cover a lot of ground from living through the beginnings of the AIDS epidemic to founding a publication and that international leather contest. So let's hit those rules to love by and jump on into it. Rules to love by. Rule number one, safe, sane, consensual, and informed. Rule number two, kinky. That's K-N-K-I. Comes from the Kinky app, available on all platforms. Not a sponsor, but it does stand for knowledge, no intolerance, kindness, and integrity. And rule number three, the quote from Mr. Paul Young. Submission is not about authority and it's not about obedience. It is all about relationships of love and respect. All right, it is Saturday, the last interview of the day with Mr. Dave Rhodes. Dave, welcome to the Crypt. Thank you for sitting down to talk to me. Now, you have been around the block for a long time, haven't you? Oh, yeah. May I ask your age? I voted for a Republican the first time I voted, (laughs) and Abraham Lincoln got elected. (laughs) Oh, I love it. I love it. You have been part of what they refer to it now as the alternative lifestyle for your entire life. Is that pretty accurate? I never hid myself. Sometimes I didn't understand what it was. I was just me. Sometimes I was out of my, more out of naivety because I was extremely naive when I was a kid. I mean, this great believing kids came from a stork. And we're talking about being not raised in anything at home at all. Wow. Just left in whatever's out there. Oh, goodness. When did it really occur to you to come out and get into a community that was different from probably how you grew up? Well, um, my coming out as gay and leather were not all that far apart. But as far as coming out as a leather part, and that's really where we're at now. Mm-hmm. So I won't go into the gay part because that's just, you know, we got so much time. Okay. Um, Drummer Magazine was out. When I was when I'd come out, Drummer had already been out about a year. And I went into one of the bookstores and came across a copy of it. Was thumbing through and hey, this looks, you know, it's pretty good. Mm-hmm. So I, I bought a copy of that and got got that home. That was like maybe about issue six or seven of Drummer. So you can think of right about wow. that time was then. Um my dad had a 7-Eleven store when we lived in San Diego mm-hmm. when he got out of the Navy. And I would go, go there from school. My dad would work the store oh, in the daytime. Yes. Or my, my mother, there. he would anyway, get her, get one of them would go home and the other, pick the other one up. And I was there for the little interim. Well, there's a magazine called Police Gives That. Mm-hmm. It was this mainstream magazine, but all the cops and the uniform and all, all the masculine stuff like that. And I was enjoying that, not knowing why, but I enjoyed it. So I knew I had that copy of that one out. And they had a competitor magazine. I can't remember what the other name was. But I I was able to look at both of these and enjoy them. Mm-hmm. Not knowing there was any sexual connection to it at all. Wow. But I felt good after I did. <laughs> so then years later drummer comes around, ah, this matches Put that, start putting dots together, and I'm intelligent enough it doesn't take long. So, and and drummer was what led to to the leather experience for you. The leather that lifestyle. was hey, well, let me go into leather bars. Actually, the advocate had a lot of that too, mm-hmm. because they had they had ads for the leather bars in there. Oh, okay. So I can't just put that all to drummer. The advocate has to get credit. And they had a competitor named News West. They came out every other week, and they just flip flop. Advocate, News West, Advocate, News West. Oh, okay. And they were newspaper like format, like the Leather Journal is now. And do you remember about what year that was? 76. Oh, okay. 77. 
So you're talking about 42 years ago. Right. So, and, and then when I got involved in the leather community, somebody I, somebody met me at a bar called Gauntlet 2, a guy named Daddy Bob, and he put on some pretty good parties and stuff. Well, he, it took me a little 1983 for somebody to show an interest. So I'm going to these places, coming there, leaving empty, you know, mm-hmm. driving in for Ventura and Oxnard. So... Um, Good bathhouses and you know all that, mm-hmm. and but not really making a connection. He made him. I got invited to one of his summer parties. He put a birthday party on for his partner, and he did a New Year's Eve party. And some of the older guys will know that because you have hundreds of people at these parties. Oh wow! And it wasn't sex parties. It was good humor and good friends and eating a lot of good food. Yeah, mm. it was good. Well, one of the guys there, a guy named Chuck Spiro. He invited me to go to one of the club meetings, a club called Samandros, hmm. which is um, it was Greek words put together. And it's a man something. I can't remember now. I mean, so much. I could find that out. But um got invited to that, liked it, got involved with that very quick. Then I was deeply into it. And then it was... In a year's time, at that point, I ended up moving into Hollywood. Oh, okay. And got a member, became a member of that club. Within less than a year, I was like the vice president of it. And then a year later, president of the club for a couple of years. Wow. So you were around for nearly the start. I know we credit the old guard and World War II creating right. what we know as the leather culture. I was born in 77. What kind of transformations did you see throughout those early years between 77 and say 85, 1990, when you were moving, you know, into the LA area? And well, okay, 76 through, um, to 78, 79, I'd moved up to Northern California for a short while. And, um, there was something called Bob Dameron's Handbook, and it was a gay guide. You could buy these at certain places and list of all the gay places and gay friendly places, whether parks or bars or clubs or stores and restaurants and the whole thing. In Southern California, there were 625 gay or gay friendly bars. Oh, wow. That's an incredible amount. Then, when I was up in um, Northern California, and this was in um, 78. So when I started getting sick, they were coming down with cold and flu. Then one of them died, and we couldn't figure out what it was. I remember being a one guy that stayed with a guy who did that sex. I'm glad we didn't because he was gone a month later. Oh, he was we were talking, but he was the one who was telling me that somebody else had died from it. Well, all of a sudden, this was hitting, and it wasn't talked about in the news. We were just seeing these people, you know, it was some bad strain of the flu or something. No idea that it was related to sex. Then it started revealing itself pretty quick as the numbers started running up. Yeah. So that took over. And, you know, AIDS hit a little bit earlier than they're publicizing, by about a year earlier. I've recently watched a documentary on it that seemed a lot more accurate to what I've heard from people that were alive to know what was really going on with the AIDS epidemic, as it's referred to now. How did that directly impact? the leather scene it hit it hard i mean uh, this is like the like vietnam to about the 10th power wow i mean i remember vietnam in school and friends in high school they died or got hurt or mm-hmm. or whatever and that was that was scary but when this hit it was that all of a sudden became nothing compared to what vietnam was because it, it was closer to home yeah does it have any has it had any lasting effects? I mean, and I'm not trying to sound cold, uh, because I understand that all of the people that were lost has certainly affected everyone that is still here. But as far as continuing impacts in education or safe sex, any of that nature, did it actually do anything that is of a lasting effect that you've seen i think it did we realized that we had to band together 
And we're, we're burying our friends, and some of them are figuring they're going to be burying us. Mm-hmm. You didn't know who was going to go next. I mentioned the club called St. Andros a few minutes ago. Mm-hmm. In that club, in six month period before the club, what this one club, we had 18 members of a small club die oh, God. in six months. That's three a month. And then, the, you know, that, and this was, this was 1985. You know, it was further down the road. Yeah. But we wanted to have to tell you, and the legends helped out too. The women came in and were a major help because mm-hmm. the women weren't getting AIDS. We were. They could have gone on and very well done their own merry way and done their own thing, but they didn't. They stopped and they took care of people in mass. Even some of the most separatist lesbians, the ones that, you know, mm-hmm. many of those, not all, but many of, were there to help. So we realized we had to do, it wasn't just a political thing anymore. This was physical survival. We were battling a disease, not, we had to battle people to get our disease taken care of, but disease itself was the number one enemy. One of my teachers, uh, and I graduated high school in 95, he quit teaching in 93 when I was a sophomore because he was sick. And he passed away right after our graduation ceremonies. Within a couple of days, Barry Nakora was his name. And he was the first person that I'd ever knew that was HIV positive or, or went on to have AIDS and passed from it. So I just seeing him and how it affected him, I couldn't imagine what it was like when you're talking about three people a month. And that three people just out of that one club. Yeah, out of just. And one. that's some. That's the club that has meetings once a month and a board meeting once a month. Yeah. We're meeting, seeing each other twice a month. Throughout our regular lives, our work and other social areas, there's others. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we're seeing we didn't know. Yeah. And we're just getting rid off and renting up as a flu or whatever. Yeah. Colds were flu was going around. So I, probably hospitals probably told he died this and that, and they just they didn't know what it was. Other than that, they just told he died of a flu. Yeah. So obviously you've done a a lot of work within the leather community, the Los Angeles twenty eighteen leather, leather, leather pride. Yeah, this was LA's leather pride week from last year, eighteen. Uh huh. But actually, it's oh, two weekends and many events during the midweek. Okay. It's usually the fourth week, fourth week of March. Now, do you have anything to do with the competitions, like the inter- International Person of Leather? Or I founded the International, the Mister and Ms. International Leather Contest. You founded those, right? Wow. Okay. And, so, and that came out of basically you're seeing a lot of the muscle guys and certain type of winning the titles, and. I, it was, it was okay. There's got to be more. I found the leather journal was on a similar premise. Yeah. There's something out there for more of us. Okay. And the categories, the, the categories of the contest were such constructed as linked to a certain type of winning. Yeah. We just made some changes in that. Came up with a contest. One of the um, one of the things when we add a category and come up with. Is um, you can interview a contestant for six or seven minutes. It's like a relief pitcher coming in in, in the seventh inning. Most of going to get the baseball reference, but it's going to it's going to throw two fastballs, a slider, and maybe a curveball, or a, or a screwball, or one of the pitch mm-hmm. strikes a guy out, two out, boom, innings over, bases are loaded, left, and you get out of the inning. And then in an interview, you can snow judges that quickly. Wow! So we said, okay. Most of the things that are done that a title holder does either good during their title year or does bad during their title year are things that happen off stage. And this is is the drunken behavior, rudeness of people, or they're really helpful. They find that lonely person over there, and they're the ones going over talking to them and visiting with people. They're doing that extra special thing, and that's what's not judged. So we had a category, and we called it Fetish Image at the time. The new producer of it, we changed, we changed it to um, Social Interaction or some name of that nature. But this was, we, we, we had, a, we, when, when the meet and greet started, when the judges and the people coming to the event 
and the contestants and the producers are all hobnobbing and socializing each other. You see that. But their interaction, the interaction with people was viewed by the judges all the way up time they sat down at the table to judge the stage part of the contest. It was 15 minutes before the contest started. They would fill a score out for this, this fetish image category. And based on their interaction with the people and the behavior and the attentiveness, that became a judge category. And that's probably the biggest thing about one, but that's one thing I come up with. How many people were involved in, are you the primary founder of that or is? I am the founder. I am the founder. You are the founder. Okay. Another few helped on and came on and worked with it, but it was. And what year was that? Uh, 1996. In 96. And we had had transgender people. Um, I just want to tell people we had the first transgender international title holder, but I was wrong. Apparently, um, Spencer Bird said from Seattle was international Miss Leather prior to this Daddy Joe in 1996. But we've had, we've had, we have different races. We've had different genders win both sides. MTF, FTM, male, mm-hmm. all these identities. Vaughn, who has Vaughn Trammell, who has the contest now, add another category, MX. MX? Mix. Oh. Whether it's, I'm not going to try to explain it because I'm probably going to come up with an accurate explanation. Okay. Just because I haven't figured out how to word it properly. Fair enough. But it is something for the gender beyond the binary, you know. And yeah. Olympus is, uh, it fits with the Olympus idea. Okay. For the people beyond them. So do you still, you obviously still have a lot to do with it then? Well, I'm a permanent judge <laughs> in the contract. That's one of the uh, as you should be. So excellent. But she was the system with her, and I let her do the thing. I don't see what I'm telling you. Okay. This is the way we used to do it. No, she was hers. So I, I guess uh, as a founder of it, then you weren't allowed to compete. Yeah, that would be kind of yeah. <laughs> I can now if I wanted to not judge. Yeah. Or run for personal weather. I could have thought of that. That kind of branched off of Olympus. Some people, you know, had other ideas. And then the personal weather, what it is, they have a contest. It elects one individual. It's not a Mr. and a Ms. It's one for everybody and it's one title. There's not a blue, black. There's not all these other ones. It's just one. So, And the people who were very involved with Olympus broke off and did that. So I'm supportive of that. I mean, they gave me a lot of time in their years and stuff. So it's only fair, yeah. I see there's a lot of people walking around DomCon that have different leather sashes right. on. Title holders. Yeah, okay. different title holders. And all of that stems from what you have founded, am I correct? No, it's International Mr. Leather started in 1979 okay. in Chicago. That's right. And many people have heard the name Chuck Winslow. That's yes, like Chuck Winslow. He founded that. Then International Miss Leather came along. After that was Mr. Miss National Leather Association. It, the drummer contest, Mr. Drummer, Drummer Boy. Then it became later, became the international drummer when they get in contests in some other countries. So Olympus is far from being the first. All these were going along. We said, we saw it. They said, ah, this is one thing we could add. Now, a lot of these contests have picked that fetish image category up. Not all of them have, but a good fair number have. So at its core, the core values of what it is to be leather, how do you explain that? Because there's such a variety. My definition of leather, I mean, some people say leather, and that's people who wear leather. And that's, okay, that's not a wrong definition. Mm-hmm. I have a broader definition. And a guy named Race Bannon, who that's the name most of you probably know. Race Bannon. Came Absolutely. up with the term kinksters. Yes. And that is also a pretty, fairly accurate term. And I've used that. And when I've written, all the time I've credited him because I like credit for our words when we make them up. <laughs> so crazy, deservingly came up with a good one with that. Mm-hmm. But with the Leather Journal, we see this all under on an umbrella. There's some that might be into rubber, but I don't know leather at all. Mm-hmm. But they're fitting into that kink, twisted. It's beyond beyond the norm. It's, you know. 
Henry David Thoreau, you know. They're all marching to different brummers on this band. Imagine a football field, a big band out there. Everyone of these people are marching to a different drummer. Yeah. The Stanford band during the 70s, for instance. Yeah. They're <laughs> being the Stanford football. <laughs> but I know some of the people that I've talked to that consider the quality of a person, if you're somebody that values respect and honor and trust and dignity and equality, then whether you wear leather or not. I struggle with coming up with one definition. You can sit there and put a stamp on and that's it. Put this in the dictionary, you know. And I've seen it because I've I've judged 475 contests over the years, including IML four times. So one thing is, and I know it's that way with IML, that, they're looking for something. They don't tell judges what they're looking for. None of these contests, if they do, it's rare. But what are the judges looking for? You hear that question. And it's usually they're looking for someone who can represent the title honestly, fairly, without prejudice, and basically looking for the best person to fill the job. And title holding is a job in a way. Hopefully, you're not getting paid for it, not monetarily wise, anyway. But, um, they're looking for people who are comfortable in their own skin. Well, you can be nude. It's true. I mean, the guy who won the SMS leather last night, well, not in 18, but 17, Ralph Bernot, was um, Mr. G and I, one of the gay naturalists, gay naturalists international. I believe it is. And there's, um, there's C-Men, which is California men, is like the news group. And this gen, this group that Ralph Bernard is part of, that's about nudity. They're not wearing leather. I mean, well, he's got leather, man. He's got more. He's got more leather than probably all the things that I have. If you add the value of it, so. But I mean, so right there, that came right down to it. Are you comfortable in your own skin? And nothing on, and you're comfortable wearing your own skin. And to the point that even an IML was selected based on that. So that took a long time to live to that point. But that got accomplished as the, the goal of that contest. So, yeah, it's about being comfortable in your own skin, which leads to I mean, one question is probably going to come up. What advice have you got to give to anybody? The always, that pitch is always going to come up, and I'm waiting for it. That ball's going like in about the third deck in center field. That one's going to hit the scoreboard in, in Wrigley Field. Yeah, it is coming <laughs> yeah, up. It's coming up. The best advice, be yourself. Be honest, be fair, be truthful, but also be truthful and fair and honest to yourself. You can try to be, emulate Tom O'Finley. You can try to emulate IML. You can try to emulate Dave Rhodes or Jude Tom McCarthy or Mr. Cyan. Dave Rhodes and Mr. Cyan and all these people should be the best at being those people. You can't, but you can be the best at being you. I can't be you. Right. Tony LeBlas, who owned Drummer. Gene Barney, who founded Drummer. A woman, by the way, founded Drummer. Shocked wow. to so many people because this is the men only. The men yeah. only group. This is for men only. Yeah. It's like, you know, Jesus was Jewish. Well, the founder of Drummer was a woman. <laughs> with other writers, with Jack Fritcher and others. But, you know. Mm-hmm. And that same principle applies. So that, you know, but be yourself. I think that's the best advice that anybody has given and should be the most obvious thing to people. But we do latch on to those we want to mimic them. I know I've asked some very basic questions, but this is for a 101 and trying to give people an introduction so that they can research some more and get to know more about you and the history of what we're talking about today. And I've got a um, couple things. Uh, I am the founder of the Leather Journal. I also founded the Pantheon of Leather Conservist Awards. Over 850 awards have been given out over the years to people who have had that. Okay, those are mentioned now. But what I wanted to get to, rather than dwell on those, because we spent enough on the Olympus and the title part of it, mm-hmm. was... Well, part about being yourself, well, part of your mind is yourself. You come up with ideas. You come up with this thing, why doesn't somebody try this? How about this? Well, ideas are like sperm. Once, well, 
but some of them come out. How many of them actually become born? You know, get aborted by our own mind. Yeah. We're aborting some of our own dreams by not even acting on them because this will fail. Nobody will like it. Well, they don't want, they don't, they don't dislike it either unless they hear about it and you find a way to present it. Sometimes you'll have to go person to person to person to person to finally get somebody to listen to you. And that time you'll figure out a way to have a presence someone so they might want to listen to it. But um, get your idea up there. Gene Barney had an idea. Tony DeBloss had an idea. Mm-hmm. Chuck Renzo. These are people who are revered. Mm-hmm. They all had ideas. There's a lot of people out there with ideas. But every one of these names that you're hearing out there, they have one thing in common. They acted on the ideas. They didn't fall to their own fears. No, but we're all, just, you know, we're, t- we're trained to say no. Yeah. Uh, From Jill- birth, no, no, no. You know who yeah. Jillian, Jillian Michaels is? She's a, a she was on TV with The Biggest Loser. She's, oh, okay. yeah, yeah. I don't care for that kind of stuff, but she does. Well, the have one a- guy, the, the guy who had that thought is a ring. Sometimes I watch that stuff for one reason alone. Well, she she does. uh, I think she's a gorgeous woman. I I would watch the show for her. You have her. I think we both be happy. That's right. (laughs) Hey, keep it up. We're turned into a circle round. (laughs) But uh, no, she does have one quote that I love. It's why give up? Why accept failure when success is still an option? That's good. But it is a very valid point that I think really goes along with what you're saying. I worked in the psychology field for 20 years and come to believe that every decision that we make is based off of two things, either love or fear. Right. And we can accept that self-love and the love of others and community and family and try to work to better ourselves, or we can fall to our fears and hide in the shadows and do nothing. Well, they're closing down the center here shortly, so I'm going to have to get one it wrapped more, up. One more, me... one more I want yes, to put in there. Definitely. There's a common philosophical question. Is the glass half full or half empty? My answer to that is yes. You got a half a glass of water, half a glass of air, or whatever it is, mm-hmm. assuming that you're in the atmosphere. Well, right. to the person in the desert, that bottle, that glass is half full of water that they need. Yeah. You're on the Titanic. Or you're in a submarine that's having trouble. You're down the bottom of a swimming pool. That half glass of the air. So just depends on the situation. Because you don't ignore the other half as waste. The automatic assumption is well, it's half full of water. Mm-hmm. And water's good, and the air is. And we can't live without either of those things. No, so. I didn't want to be a chemist. <laughs> you know what? I went to college. I got. I got. I worked on my master's degree. And probably the brightest thing I did going through school was I figured a way how to circumvent biology. Tell me more. I tell me never more. took even one semester of biology. I got into physics. I got into other sciences and <laughs> geology, all of them. But I was all the frogs. It was like, ew. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, so that- I, you know, figure ways, figure ways out. <laughs> when there's a will, there is a way. You just have to not be afraid to find it. If there's a will, leave me in it. (laughs) Dave, again, I really, really thank you for your time and for sitting down with me. Now, you have a weekly blog that you do? Right. Dave wrote someday. It's on the leatherjournal.com. Okay. T-H-E-L-E-A-T-H-E-A-R, journal.com. Put the bones. It's like the Ohio State University. All right. Same thing. And um, we put four blogs out a month. When there's a fifth Wednesday of the month, that's time off. That's time off. Okay. And right. they're very often, they will come out on Thursday or Friday. And one guy putting all this together, like we had Claw and a bunch of several deadlines the last two hump days. One came out on a Friday and one came out late Thursday night. So oh, okay. it's generalized the hump day. That's the intent is to have it out by Wednesday night. <laughs> so you might have a, you know. Oh, my, my listeners know that. I intend on having an episode out every other, but eh, sometimes it might be Sunday until one gets out, but they're pretty loyal to it because the content from what they tell me is uh, really good. So they will, I will put a link 
to your blog in the show notes. So when people pull this up on their phones to listen to it, all they have to do is scroll down and they will see the link. They can tap on it and it'll take them straight to you. And that is going to wrap us up for this Saturday at DomCon Los Angeles 2019. Dave Rhodes, thank you again so very much. It is truly an honor. Cryptors, thank you so much for sticking around and for tuning in to this episode. There were a lot of things that actually got cut out of this because of some of the background noise. And I hated that, but there was just no way to take some of that out. What I will say is that there was a lot of laughing and some tears talking about some old times coming up in the AIDS epidemic. Probably one of the most emotional interviews that I've done that ran the gamut from laughter to tears. I really enjoyed the opportunity to speak with Dave, an absolutely amazing person. I will have some upcoming announcements. To make so stay tuned for those i'm working on a few new projects that will directly impact the show no it's not ending the schedule's not going to change i'm still going to try to publish every monday i know last week and this week i was late i've been working extended hours so that's why these are coming out a day late but i'm not changing the publish date to tuesdays it will stay on mondays anyway cryptors Patrons, thank you so very much. If you're getting something out of the show and you would like to show your support, go to patreon.com slash cauldron script. Of course, there's a link for it in the show notes. And you can be one of the show producers like pro producer Lily Chaos, executive producers, Jeremiah, Arcane DGR, and Violet Aurelia, Feline Rouge, Baby Love 2269, and Faisal, senior producers. Matt, Roxy Bear, Emerald Wolf, JK, Sort Out the Kinks, Delilah, Sir Mutual Respect, Master Gabriel, and Theod 123. Producers, Kane Sin, That Place in Oklahoma City, Thank You, Miter, Olive Eyes, Zine, and Alexandria, and junior producers, K2SO, Buffalo Dom 84, Lay Sumi, Haley, Morgan, and Not the Daddy. All of my contact information is in the show notes. For the direct link to those show notes, cauldronscript.com slash 226 for this episode. This has been Master Cauldron and Dave Rhodes for cauldronscript.com. Unearth the truth. <laughs>